Good morning and welcome to the third and final day of our 2021 Fulbright Conference, Fulbright at 75, celebrating a legacy of global friendships. The first two days have featured wonderful and thought-provoking talks, and I know that today will be the same. Hello, my name is Rob Lively. I am sitting up in Maine, and I will serve as the moderator of our first session today, poster session number two, education, COVID-19, and mental health. Please use the chat function to share your name and where you served your Fulbright. Also, please use the Q&A function during the talks to post any questions or comments you may have for the presenters. Please include the presenters' names uh, as to who you are directing your comments to. At the end, we'll have a Q&A session. In this session, Education, COVID-19, and Mental Health, we have Dr. Maja Atta, who will be talking on combating COVID's isolative challenges through the renaissance of school soundscapes. Next, we'll have Dr. William Hills, telehealthcare then and now development of virtual service delivery in the COVID area. Then Dr. Teresa Kennedy, International Engineering Design Challenge, Innovations to Address the COVID-19 Pandemic. Following her will be Ms. Heather Ridge, Building Partnerships to Build Resiliency, Using the International Exchange Alumni Network to Address Mental Health Needs Within the Refugee Community. Next, Mr. Al Schleicher, Global Partnership, Secondary School Debate and Language Acquisition. And then Ms. Emily Tan, Come for the Songs, Stay for the Moms, community-based postpartum support in libraries across Sydney. So Majo, we will turn the floor over to you and um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Majdati, a professor of comparative literature. I'm basically um, doing my project in Oman. Uh, but I'm referring here in my presentation to a project that we have been working on since the start actually of the global pandemic COVID-19. So I'm going to share now my screen, okay. Uh, hopefully you can see it all. Yeah, you just need to start the slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, basically this is about an initiative that has been inducted at Phoenix Private School, a leading KG-12 private school in Syria, where the uh, mother language is Arabic, of course. Uh, the foreign languages department there offers American, uh, French, Russian curricula, where students find a space to communicate in different languages. Well, in uh, spring 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has put a halt to such program because of the wide you know, uh, school uh, closure. Of course, most of the schools shifted to online platforms. But we as advisors of the foreign languages program perceived a peculiar challenge. So uh, that the challenge actually was about the unexpected, uh, the new normal of COVID-19, which released a reality of what's considered abnormal to prevail. So foreign language programs that are based on communication has faced, uh, have faced a reality of isolation that limits foreign language communication. So what was the call? Um, we actually, as advisors and the students, uh, you know, created a kind of online community where uh, we initiated the hashtag campaign called Translate Into Beauty Initiative. Actually, it's a call to initiate interaction via digital and online platform. However, uh, it's a unique, uh, you know, platform because uh, its project is conducted to revise digital and online communication and shift into a student-oriented reality through soundscapes effects that the challenge COVID-19 protocols and you know what happens after, especially when we talk about post-traumatic um, uh, COVID-19. So uh, translate into beauty initiative. Um, it's a call 
uh, that, uh, you know, advise ESL students to intervene with monocultural visual reception and recreate cultural responsive digital and virtual annotations, soundscapes, and podcast compositions of the visual textual pop culture environment. And through this intervention, uh, we actually, uh, you know, found a kind of new contribution to the foreign languages program in the educational system in Syria. So uh, I'm going through the parts of this campaign, the initiative Translate into Beauty, where we first actually, uh, you know, encourage students to go through their inventory of comics and uh, cartoons that they used to watch and still watching um, from different cultures. So we decided to try to dub such traditional comics um, by adding the students actually soundscapes, uh, their sound effects, uh, their own music, their own improvisation. And um, these actually Actually, comics were uh, translated and dubbed from English, French, German, Russian, Spanish, Arabic into English. So even you know English ones were reversed, and at the same time, through the addition of soundscapes, we were able to produce a new English version. Such diversity creation has been shaped actually by multivocal reception that minimized the isolative effects of uh, you know the post COVID nineteen lockdown reality. So as you can see from this image, uh, we have like students trying to create their own videos. And I took actually a screenshot uh, of one of these, you know, because we have posted them on the school's Facebook page where uh, the parents would follow and other actually students will follow as well and participate in the chat. Again, um, you know, uh, we have, if I go back, you know, to the previous one, we see that this is uh, the story of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, such a story has been read as a story of hope in the COVID-19 context. So we recontextualize the whole story and it has been done uh, by a student in grade five. Um, along with the uh, project of dubbing traditional comics, we uh, actually try to include, uh, you know, the student's own uh, input into various um, stories like the, the one we have here, the little match girl, where the match girl actually as a story found, found its Arabic version through an interesting dubbing that imagined the match girl in Syria, again, in the COVID-19 reality. So um, through this you know, uh, kind of re rediscovery of the traditional inventory, uh, students were able to develop their linguistic skills and at the same time to activate their culturally diverse new vocabs that positively reimagine the, the world through the vocabs that, that I have learned. Even we uh, kind of innovated a uh, you know, kind of English, Arabic vocabs that really such stories. Humor is there, like, you know, we have um, the story of Masha, which now uh, Masha is investigating the cause of COVID-19. So uh, as you see here, we have dubbed hilarious comics, uh, which have been activated to communicate an alternative positive reality of COVID-19 and promise a healthy comeback. Of course, uh, you know, this is actually the part we were, were considering actually, the post-traumatic symptoms of COVID-19, such as depression, phobia on our students. And through this dubbed video, uh, we find a way to undercut you know, such symptoms and induce laughter by citing local registers. So we see um, through Masha, we have uh, like local incidents happening in Syria during the COVID-19 that made the students actually laugh all the time and forget all, everything about the lockdown. Uh, along with the comics, uh, we have uh, you know, the initiative of dubbing word stories and the Dubbing initiative has revisualized the genre of word literature to, you know, a kind of rereading of its past phase of normal, uh, where all of these stories uh, were read in a way uh, that we have a kind of, uh, you know, something expected related to rigid ethnicity, race, social class dichotomies. And now we see that the students have found their space actually to um, mobilize such dichotomies and produce a kind of linguistic and context related creativity. So we see the princess is now uh, using her own language again, you know, using the Syrian dialect to indicate that the fact that such dichotomies no longer exist. So we use the COVID-19 situation to show that such rigidness is, uh, you know, easy to break. Uh, 
Also, we have like Alice in Wonderland, another example, you know, of word story. And, uh, you know, notice that all of these uh, word stories were contributing to a kind of, uh, you know, a reality, which is the reality of ending, you know, that there is always sickness, there is always death, there is always an ending to each story. So uh, through the initiative Translate into Beauty uh, and the dubbing, actually, uh, activities, we have involved the proposition of open-endedness that violates the conventional endings in word stories. So now the stories uh, through uh, the student soundscapes have no endings and uh, the absence of uh, such endings uh, actually imagines the possible that counteracts the COVID-19 dominant story of sickness and death. Uh, again, part of the initiative, we had adaptations of bullying films uh, and again, uh, this is you know, a part where we were even you know, concerned about the psychological uh, you know, uh, effects of COVID-19 as a precautionary measure that anticipates post-COVID-19 anxieties. ASL students were actually encouraged to improvise both pre-traumatic and post-traumatic spaces to realize healing. So um, they anticipated, uh, you know, new forms of bullying at school uh, in the context of, you know, COVID-19, like if anyone has a kind of cold, he or she is going to be, um, you know, considered a COVID-19, you know, um, patient. So um, they have addressed bullying in schools uh, through using actually um, previous films that talk about bullying in schools, uh, but in a way that attract our attention to the fact that there, there is a new form of bullying going to happen in the post COVID-19 situation. So uh, basically the students uh, use their COVID-19 sound escapes to visualize possible forms of bullying. And here we have the image or the visual of Wonder Movie that talks about bullying. And uh, you know these are images of our students trying to uh, you know, watch the um, video in, um, you know, in a kind of online setting. Uh, and uh, you know, this is actually after you know, the end of the lockdown, they were actually uh, reflecting on such experience because we we're working on it even after you know, the end of the lockdown. So um, they have learned that through digital storytelling adaptations, annotations, that they can create a kind of therapeutic impact that would help uh, their classmates actually reread uh, films and address the emergence of COVID-19 bullying experiences in schools worldwide. So uh, here is actually the image uh, of our students. As you can tell here, we have KG and even elementary school students and junior high school, school students who were involved in the project in the initiative. So they contributed you know, to such stories. And um, you know, I'm, I'm going to you know, play this uh, segment uh, to show that how this hashtag, as uh, one of our students said, is circulating for a future that's more beautiful than all past. Welcome to Phoenix Broadcast Center. Actually, our grade six champions worked hard to analyze Wonder, a wholesome film with powerful messages centering around different and social questions of striking importance. As for today, Luna, Michael, and Jane are going to talk to us about three major concepts concerning bullying. The first one is that of identity. So Luna, how can you think of the way identity relate to bullying? Yeah, I think that other people are more ourselves than we are, because in a way, we are the combined effort of everyone we've ever known. So, some people allowed themselves to be made the real victim the moment they bully others. Maybe they had never met enough identities to think of differences as a part of our nature. Michael, what about the second concept? Yeah, in fact, I'd like to start with a quotation by Albert Einstein who once said that the world as we have created is in, it is in the process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So we can now easily relate bullying to process of thinking or the way of thinking as a bully cannot change the image they have towards different figures without changing the way they think of some of them being different. It is something that has a lot to do with culture, by the way. So this is actually a sample uh, where we use the movie Wonder as a venue, actually, and the segue to talk about uh, the COVID-19 
team bullying experience that we may expect, you know, and even happened in our schools. So basically, this is uh, my presentation in the poster. As you can tell here, uh, there is a link between, you know, the educational system now uh, that takes into consideration, uh, you know, um, language efforts, uh, and at the same time, you know, the, the foreign language uh, program efforts uh, to undercut the effect of COVID-19, you know, and anxieties on our students and to try uh, a new way actually to renovate the use of uh, languages in the learning process. Thank you so much, that's all. Thank you so much, Marsha, that was excellent. Um, William, we look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. And slide show for current slide is good. Okay. Yes. All right, great. Thank you so much. We're happy to be here today. I am here with uh, my co-presenter today, uh, Dr. Matthew Murphy. Our third uh, person on this research, Karen Hills, is actually a behavioral health provider, and she's providing telehealth care as we speak. All of us have experienced a change in our lives during the pandemic and healthcare has been a part of that. Uh, safety and security issues, same restrictions for all of us, um, have promoted implementation of telehealth care services. Now, telehealth care can be thought of in different ways. We're going to focus today on synchronous uh, services, which are real time online video connections between healthcare providers and constituents or clients. Uh, but in general, telehealth is looking to deliver virtual services across time and uh, across time and space. There are a lot of asynchronous services available today. Um, typically, this is more pre-programmed, um, it's accessible any time. There are certainly a lot of benefits of telehealth care. Um, Health care costs have been spiraling, and so this is already looking to be a cost saver. Uh, clients particularly like it, ease of scheduling, things such as uh, better scheduling for child care, less time away from work, and providers are finding that they like it for a lot of things too. Not everything, of course, but, but it does work very well as part of our health care system for certain, certain types of issues. Another type of benefit too is it, it has the potential to reach into underserved areas. This has been an, this has been considered very desirable for a while. Uh, rural communities often in the United States have less primary care um, and sometimes no mental health care providers. So the possibility of this virtual service delivery to reach out of the urban areas into the rural areas is, is very strong and very, very powerful. Now we've seen more um, actual mental and behavioral health provision prior to the pandemic. Less so in medicine, the physicians uh, would typically cite the lack of empirical support for the um, telehealth techniques. And this is, this is certainly reasonable, um, but we understand that in many circumstances, this is, is the physicians that need to be convinced and get on board and they are, and they are now doing that. In the United States in March in 2020, the National Emergencies Act loosened the, the restrictions to provide legal protections that the, that the uh, different providers needed. Um, certain types of internet-based communication devices were not previously approved, such as smartphones, and you can think of confidentiality. If people are receiving, let's say, a mental health service over a smartphone, well, normally in the mental health arena, we like to have the environment carefully controlled, but with a smartphone, some might, might be actually in a mental health session in a Starbucks or something, you know, where there's less control over that. Um, now services can be provided to patients in their homes, um, across state lines in the United States, and then at reimbursement rates that are comparable to the traditional visits. And so this has all been important in helping telehealth deliver. These emergency measures are still in effect right now. Um, and now in the United States, just about all physical mental health entities offer some form of telehealth services. And the evaluation research is ongoing 
side by side with the development, the implementation of the services, what works, what doesn't work, and then that's helping to determine the future of healthcare uh, beyond the pandemic. Our study, um, the research we've been doing over this past six months to a year is to look at synchronous video-based healthcare access. Uh, and we wanted to look at how this is provided for physical and mental health. We wanted to look at consumer satisfaction and what people thought about the future, whether they anticipated virtual healthcare would exist following the pandemic and whether they thought they would would use that as well. We developed an online uh, means of communication and we reached out to uh, university students, um, individuals we called adults, and then retirement age participants. And in this case, they were members of a lifelong learning institution associated with our university and the age range for that is 55 and, and older. Uh, and uh, we ended up getting usable data from 685 participants divided, not entirely equally between the groups, but we had large sample sizes. Uh, we varied in gender identity, ethnicity, age, and, and experience using telehealth care. And these are the things that we assessed there using that. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my um, my research partner, Dr. Matthew Murphy here. All right, so we're gonna switch out masks here. There we go. So what did we find from this? Well, one of the, the primary findings we found is that about half of participants at the time of this study had used virtual health care at some point. Um, and this is a dramatic uptick from prior years, even as of uh, 2019. We found that most of these participants uh, had used this during the pandemic rather than before. And it was almost three times as many uh, had used it during the pandemic compared to beforehand. <clears throat> and this is likely due to these changes that have come from increased availability and accessibility, as well as a, a driving need. So it seems to be that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a driving factor in this increase in telehealth. Uh, when we looked at the types of services that were being used um, across the board, people are using uh, virtual health care for physical health services more than mental health care. Um, and this is not too surprising. Uh, we did find some age differences, however. So even though across all age categories, physical health care was the primary service for virtual health care. Amongst college age students, mental health care was much more prominent than in adults who were using mental health care virtual services much more than retirement aged. Uh, so we see a definite gulf there um, across age ranges. We also saw some very interesting gender differences as well. So women were using mental health care twice as often as men, uh, which is not too surprising because that's what we see in, with um, in-person healthcare services. There, there's a mental health stigma amongst men. Uh, mental health care is used a lot less frequently amongst men. So this does highlight that uh, there needs to be continued uh, education and advocacy for men's mental health, and that carries over into the virtual world as well. Uh, overall, participants were very happy with their um, uh, with their healthcare services. So uh, we measured this on a six point rating scale from one being uh, strongly dissatisfied to six being strongly satisfied. And the median responses across the board were five, a slightly not significantly lower um, satisfaction for college age students at around 4.25. So in general, satisfied. Um, and this means that uh, the services were meeting the expectations that people needed. Uh, they needed these services during the pandemic and those virtual services were fulfilling those needs. So that's a good thing to hear. Now, in terms of the future of uh, virtual healthcare, uh, we asked participants whether or not they thought that virtual healthcare would persist after the pandemic. And the vast majority, 95% of people said, yes, this is here to stay. So that's, the, that's what they believe. Um, However, despite that belief, only two thirds of participants actually predicted that they would use virtual health care after the end of the pandemic. So compared to the half of participants that have used it, that means that there are plenty who uh, haven't used it, but plan to. Uh, and we do see a difference across age ranges. So adults, uh, pre three quarters predicted that they will use it uh, in the future in addition to in-person services but only half of college age and retirement age participants predicted that they will use this. So there's an interesting uh, age difference there.
So what are the factors that do predict whether or not someone says that they will use virtual healthcare in the future? Well, we saw some very interesting differences uh, based on age. So for retirement age participants, um, whether they've used it in the past and how satisfied they were when they've used it in the past were positive predictors for future use. For college age participants, only prior satisfaction was a predictor. And for adult age, neither one was a predictor, indicating that adults are gonna use it regardless. Uh, across gender, uh, women for women, both prior use and satisfaction were positive predictors, whereas for men, only prior use was a positive predictor. So for women, uh, having used it in the experience matters, whereas for men, just getting them in the door is what makes them more likely to use it. So that prior experience is a big driving factor for whether or not they will use it in the future. So the take home messages here is that virtual healthcare is here to stay. Uh, people are using it much more often during the pandemic, and that is likely to continue, and people believe that it's likely to continue. So those numbers are going to keep going up. Um, it, compared to uh, 2019, those numbers were in the single and low double digits of people using it, and here we're seeing approximately 50%, and that's likely to grow. Now, we do see some key demographic differences here, and those can guide policy recommendations for governmental uh, support, as well as future directions. So if Providers want to reach everybody and want more people to use virtual uh, health care. We need to reach those college age participants and those retirement age participants in different ways. Um, we need to make sure that men, men get mental health awareness and future directions should focus on access to technology, rural areas, um, international considerations, of course, especially for Fulbright, and then what the providers think in this case. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Hills. Thank you, and uh, I, we think our time's about up, but we're certainly looking forward to questions, and we have our contact information here as well that we can put back up in a bit. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, folks. And thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, next, we have Teresa. Teresa. Okay, I'll share my screen here. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Teresa Kennedy, and I'm a professor of international STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and bilingual education at the University of Texas at Tyler. I hold a joint appointment in the College of Education and Psychology School of Education in, and in the College of Engineering. I served as a Fulbright specialist in Argentina and Ecuador, and also participated in a Fulbright Commission capacity building workshop in Hungary. I currently volunteer as a Fulbright specialist peer reviewer. Before I begin my presentation, I'd like to share a little about me, where I'm from, and what I do in my job from day to day. I live in Tyler, uh, located in East Texas, about two hours east of Dallas and just one hour west of the border of the state of Louisiana. It's a beautiful area known as the Piney Woods. You can see in the pictures here that it's very green. There's lots of lakes. We're best known for our roses and as the home of the University of Texas at Tyler. One outcome of my Fulbright experience at the University of Comahue in Argentina from 2014 to 2015 was the creation of an amazing exchange program between our two universities that brought together civil, electrical, and mechanical engineering students who spent two weeks together in Tyler, followed by two weeks in Nankin. Bringing these innovative young engineers together resulted in amazing partnerships that are still active today. Another collaboration between our two universities is the Engineering Design Challenge that I will present today. In 2012, the UT Tyler School of Education created the University Academy, a charter school system of K-12 STEM lab schools located on three separate campuses in East Texas. The University Academy is an open enrollment state-funded charter laboratory school that serves students in grades K through eight, excuse me, K through 12, the charter is focused on supporting students through STEM pathways that incorporate 21st century skills into all aspects of the curriculum. Over the last nine years, students have been engaged in blended learning through project and problem-based learning models, as well as phenomenon-based learning. UT Tyler pre-service teachers that I work with are actively involved in schools and our high school students are engaged in, in dual credit courses taught by UT Tyler professors. 
My personal role working with the schools aims to provide opportunities for teachers to engage their students in experiences that build cross-cultural understandings, as well as global awareness and STEM skills. And I provide mentoring to both teachers and their students through participation in STEM events. My presentation tells the story of one of our most recent projects, the COVID-19 Engineering Design Challenge. I created the challenge in March 2020, around the beginning of the COVID-19 spread throughout the US and the world, working in collaboration with the Texas STEM Coalition and the International Council of Associations for Science Education. Statements from the World Health Organization citing how COVID-19 has changed the world and articles from the medical community, such as the 2020 publication from the New England Journal of Medicine I included on this slide, describing unprecedented disruption of human society naturally inspire research and innovation. Who would be better to begin this quest than our youth, the next generation of scientists? The challenge is open to K-12 and university students and will continue through December, 2021. It continues and encourages students to brainstorm and meander their way through the process of designing local and global solutions to the issues they believe are important. A question I'm often asked, how did the challenge begin? Well, as schools began to close and classes were quickly moving into online environments in March, 2020, teacher stress was elevating and rightfully so. I had been communicating with teachers and teacher educators here in the US and in several countries around the world that were scrambling to place content up online for their students in response to school closures. Several colleagues asked me, what can I have my students work on while I work to place my course content online? I assisted several of my colleagues to organize random activities, but what I really wanted to do was figure out a plan for a more relevant and STEM-focused project where students could be creative and innovative. The following, the, uh, following slides describe how I came up with the idea for the COVID-19 Engineering Design Challenge and the outcome of the project today. A colleague of mine in New York City forwarded an email to me that she'd received from a local company sharing their plans to develop uh, to work with the developer build and build coronavirus quarantine houses out of unused shipping containers. I thought, wow, what a great idea. How innovative. Then I thought, I bet our students could come up with some awesome projects as well. So I created a challenge where students could design their own projects to address problems or issues they personally identified related to the pandemic. I worked up a plan aligned with the phenomenon-based learning model initiated by Finland's education system in 2016 and created teacher instructions. Phenomenon-based learning expands traditional project-based and problem-based learning approaches into learning experiences that immerse students deeper into contextual situations aligned with real life issues, while also applying knowledge and skills from multiple disciplines. In order to provide local relevance, I suggested that teachers outside the US identify an engineering innovation currently in the news in their country to respond to the needs related to the challenges presented by the pandemic. Or they could of course use the US example previously shared that involved converting unused shipping containers into quarantine houses. Four easy steps were provided to engage students in the project. First, Teachers prompt their students to think about current, the current situation, identify a, a potential need or solution related to the pandemic. Second, they ask their students to describe the issue they identified and their, eyes, and their ideas for potential solutions. The, the third step encourages students to draw their design either freehand or using drawing software available on their computers and or build a simple model with items found in their home. Many students used online design res resources such as Google SketchUp, Planner 5D, and 4Planner to draw their designs. And finally, students are provided with opportunities to share their engineering designs widely with other students, with family members, the community, et cetera. The basic idea is to encourage students to identify areas of need, brainstorm, design solutions, and communicate their designs to their classmates, family, and community members online and you know, or following physical distancing guidelines established by their teachers and or schools. The challenge provides an engaging learning experience for all students in STEM classrooms, as well as language classrooms and helps them to connect to one another and share their innovations. Teacher instructions and the student project, uh, sample project from New York City were translated into the six UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish, plus Japanese, Portuguese, and, and Turkish, thanks to several of my colleagues around the world. 
I'm extremely grateful to my colleagues who assisted with the translation of the materials as their contribution to the project made it possible for students from many countries to participate. I'd like to give a special thank you to each of them. 399 students from nine countries participated in the 2020 challenge. These students were from Argentina, China, the Dominican Republic, England, Japan, Peru, Russia, Turkey, and the US. Primary, secondary, and university students participated in the challenge, and almost half of these students were girls. With luck, the 2021 challenge will surpass 400 student participants. Students uh, from additional countries that have joined us in the challenge in 2021 so far this year include Cuba, France, Kuwait, and Mexico. Sample classroom implementation activities have included simple discussions and brainstorming sessions, student-created PowerPoint presentations, individual and group projects that included student hand-drawn designs as well as designs created with the assistance of the online tools I previously described, the building or constructed models, writing community service announcements, and even writing detailed research reports, such as the impressive papers shared from university students in Peru and Turkey. The projects have been amazing, ranging from designing masks that recycle your air so that you don't have to continuously smell your bad breath, in the words of the innovator, to recyclable face masks to help solve the problem of single mask use that are washing up on shorelines and littering the seabeds, as well as innovative sterile mask collection bins designing temperature scanning systems to be used before entering buildings, creating city designs that include recovery communities for those infected. And a personal favorite was a project that detailed designs for a treadmill system that monitors your health, including COVID testing, that is programmed with virtual tours that are educational, such as tours through a museum, as well as tours to your favorite places around the city to keep you healthy while you can't visit the gym and for when you're tired of staying at home by yourself, in the words of the student inventors. In addition, many students designed technology innovations such as a robot programmed to roam buildings providing hand sanitizer and other cleaning items, as well as disinfecting the floors that moves around the building. The list is innovative um, and the ideas and projects are truly impressive. All participating teachers were provided with a certificate of leadership and a participation certificate template to personalize for each of their students. We're currently working on a plan to create a web page dedicated to sharing student projects. And we also hope to create online student, an online student conference to enable students to share their innovations with one another in 2022. According to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, even though we are into the second year of the pandemic, some key areas still need attention although these vary depending upon the stage of the pandemic in a particular community. This is just one more reason why this engineering design challenge is so important. It provides an opportunity for students from diverse locations around the world to serve leadership roles and to develop potential solutions to the serious problems we are facing. Some of these students will become scientists in the future, and just as important, all of these students need to have the opportunity to become active global citizens. Aspiring global citizens need to develop skills related to problem solving, decision making, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. I've created an invitation with basic information about the project that you can download to share with others. I hope that you, your colleagues, and the citizen scientists in your communities will assist students to join us in the challenge. There's still time left for this year's challenge. Thank you for my, your kind of present, uh, attention to my presentation. If you're interested in more information about the COVID-19 Engineering Design Challenge, please contact me, visit the project webpage, and check out the summary of the 2020 projects. I'll place these links into the chat box after this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. And next we have Heather. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm excited to join you here today. Uh, my name is Heather Ridge and my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am a public school teacher in Colorado. Uh, I'll be co-presenting today with Deborah Young. Um, the COVID pandemic has certainly had a global impact on every aspect of our lives, including how we educate kids, and it's definitely not the last crisis uh, that children today will be asked to face. Many are already navigating the impacts of the climate crisis, the refugee crisis, poverty, homelessness, addiction, or abuse and trauma that results from these, um, from exposure to these kind of adverse childhood experiences can be a huge barrier to learning. 
And it's one that's not often addressed in traditional training programs for teachers. In 2016, I had the opportunity to be part of the uh, Fulbright Ex uh, Distinguished Awards in Teaching program in India. And on the way back from that, uh, I stopped in Greece where I was able to volunteer with an organization that was supporting uh, people in living in refugee camps that had uh, arrived seeking asylum. Uh, from staying in touch with the families and organizations there, uh, I was inspired to also reach out to refugees in my own school and community um, in Colorado uh, who were, were dealing with some of the similar trauma even after uh, safely relocating. And I wanted to do something to support youth in both locations. Uh, the need for trauma-informed practices was huge and it was growing. And it was something that I knew almost nothing about. <laughs> um, Fortunately, through participation in Fulbright, I had access to folks that did uh, through the Global Alumni Network. All of us have access to this database, which I, I think now is over 300,000 uh, folks um, who are some of the most worldly inspired, interconnected experts from all over the world, like you, um, who may be alumni from these programs. Uh, so I started searching. Uh, Dr. Vicky Koskuna and Dr. Maria Bazuli from Fulbright Greece were willing to meet with me and also connect me with other professionals in Greece uh, and elsewhere working with mental health, disaster recovery, uh, who are working in or around camps. Uh, and then from the database, we were able to find um, others, psychologist Dr. Erna Olofsson, who literally wrote the book on a specific therapy to support adolescents uh, that were dealing with uh, trauma and grief. And through the database, um, we found Dr. Deborah Young, my co-presenter today, who coincidentally lives in the same town, um, but we may never have met otherwise. And she has spent this past several decades working in refugee camps and war zones with traumatized kids and children and families and their, their whole community. So together we applied for this grant from the citizens, uh, from it's a collaboration between the US State Department and Partners of the Americas, uh, the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund grant, uh, which is available to all uh, alumni who want to form teams to address uh, a specific need or project. Since the possibility of bringing more mental health therapists into our schools and into the camps um, wasn't possible or sustainable, uh, we decided to focus on those who are already working most closely with these youth, educators, caregivers, social workers, psychologists, and medical staff in the camps and schools and shelters. Uh, we met virtually before it was cool and uh, determined these two main objectives. Uh, we wanted to focus on developing a wider understanding of trauma-informed practices and building resources uh, for social and emotional learning in these different, um, in these different settings. Uh, the work we divided up into three uh, kind of separate phases that looked at targeting different places and different um, kind of different cohorts uh, of, uh, of for delivery. So the first phase uh, took place in Colorado. Uh, it was a workshop that was provided for 30 educators uh, in American schools in, in my district. And we looked at how trauma impacts the brain and maybe expressed as behavior. Um, we workshopped some techniques for identifying and supporting vulnerable students and developed and taught some sample lessons for elementary, uh, an elementary class that looked at ways to incorporate social emotional learning practices into typical science content, which is more my background. Uh, we were hoping to collect data uh, and eventually develop kind of a shared resource um, of lessons that integrated those practices into the curriculum uh, before going to Greece uh, to, for phase two and three. But this was in February of 2020. Uh, so COVID. <laughs> uh, Deborah, did you want to chime in here? With, Heather, uh, I, I don't see Deborah on the call. Oh, um, oh okay. I don't, no worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, so we, we had to be pretty resilient as well. Um, we were really fortunate to be able to pivot um, thanks to an extension. Uh, on this grant. And we looked at what we could really take from face-to-face -face and do virtually. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in a way it was kind of amazing to have the extra time and space to really connect. Uh, a, a lot of changes happened during that time. The largest camp in Lesbos uh, burnt down and had to be rebuilt. Um, some organizations that we were working with prior had to leave. So, so it was an opportunity to really identify the needs uh, and figure out creative ways to target that. 
Uh, for example, in phase two, um, we, uh, Dr. Uh, psychologist Dr. Olofsson uh, was able to work with two court cohorts of psychologists and mental health professionals who work mostly with teenagers that are living as refugees in camps around uh, Athens, Lesbos, and Thessaloniki. Uh, one group from Doctors of the World, Medicine Sans Demand, and um, one from International Rescue Committee. And she was able to work with them online for uh, this the very specific training, looking at trauma in adolescence, uh, and then also um, using uh, supporting training manuals, which were supplied through the grant. Uh, phase three, we, we uh, were able to look at some virtual trainings that uh, Dr. Dr. Young was able to present uh, primarily to educators and caregivers from International Rescue Committee. And they were working with um, unaccompanied minors. So minors without sort of a traditional support from family. Um, we did virtual lessons um, that she developed around sort of trauma in the brain uh, and looking at factors that can build resiliency in youth uh, and those that work around them, uh, work with them. Some of these were then translated uh, through different contacts there into Farsi uh, as well as into Arabic uh, for educators that were not able to attend, uh, including community educators uh, that, that are volunteers from within the camps um, that are now teaching. We got a chance, uh, thanks to the miracle of vaccines to uh, eventually go to Greece and uh, meet uh, for some follow-up sessions with some of uh, the same cohorts and um, also use some of the data and feedback that they gave from the virtual lessons to look at um, some very specific practices, uh, including um, support around secondary and vicarious trauma, uh, which is a huge issue um, in uh, the different organizations, uh, both educational, medical, um, those working with folks living uh, in the camp as well. So looking at um, specific practices around, um, you know, identifying and supporting uh, from within an organizational structure uh, using practices like re reflective supervision um, to support staff and volunteers. Um, one of the biggest things that I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot, um, this, this was way outside my wheelhouse. So as um, a teacher, uh, you know, I became quite a student of, of these different workshops as well. And knowing how important, you know, um, who you go through trauma with is. And so that importance of that um, adult or caregiver who is able to provide sort of these positive shared emotional experiences um, is really the number one indicator of uh, ability to, um, you know, uh, thrive and, and develop through trauma. Uh, we also had an opportunity to work with um, some of these uh, community educators in a different camp on the mainland of, of Greece. Uh, looking at how different um, social and emotional practices, similar to what we did in Colorado, can be integrated into sort of everyday um, content and, um, and how that can be um, not just like a one and done sort of thing, but how we're, we're, we're constantly addressing the social and emotional um, processing of our learners and, and, and how much that affects learning. Um, so uh, we looked at that for primarily for um, elementary, uh, younger younger grades there. Um, so, yeah, I I think um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to this network. Um, I don't think I realized when I got the very first opportunity to work with Fulbright through a, a Teachers for Global Classrooms grant. Um, someone said, "Hey, welcome to the Fulbright Familia." And um, I don't think I quite realized what a resource, what a lifelong resource um, this community is. As an educator, I, um, I go to education conferences and um, the needs of today are huge. They're complex um, and they require complex introductory, uh, you know, interdisciplinary uh, attention. And that's something that the Fulbright, the Global Alumni Network was able to provide. So I just want to end with a quick plug. If you aren't already in this network, uh, I've got the link there. You can go to the uh, alumni directory and um, um, yeah. Were, was I sharing my screen? Uh, no, Heather, I did, we didn't see your screen, but. Okay, apologies. It looks like Deb was trying to log in at the same time. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. So I think that that might have blocked the uh, the images and pictures, um, but uh, or I'm not quite sure. But I'm happy to include a link to my presentation if. Uh, oh, yeah, if we see something. To. We see something now. Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and just share that in the chat. Uh, I can yeah. uh, 
share images. Apologies, uh, we should have practiced perhaps together as co-presenters. <laughs> uh, but I do wanna share that link if that's all right at the very end. Um, so uh, just encourage you to, um, to, to fill out your profile um, because the, the connections that we were able to make through this global uh, alumni network allowed us to really um, you know, create a project that addressed some specific needs with skills that, that, you know, um, that I didn't have otherwise. So uh, just a, a big thank you to, uh, to those of you that are already are participating. And if you haven't, um, please do fill out this, uh, this link here. Heather, could you also copy and paste that into the chat? It might be uh, easier. You, you just make sure you chat with everybody. You bet. Sorry about right. that. No worries. No worries. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, next, we have Al. Al Schleicher. Yep. yep. I think we're good. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Is everything okay with my screen? Looks great. Okay. Uh, so, hi, my name is Al. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the partnership and some findings that I found as a Fulbright distinguished uh, teacher to the Netherlands. Uh, currently, um, I stepped away from the classroom for a few years. I'm currently teaching in the School of Teacher Education at San Diego State University. Um, and I was connected to the University of Amsterdam when I was on the Fulbright. Um, I have some overarching questions for the panel and for those who are who are piping in regarding partnerships and um, you know the challenges and I, I think some of the presenters have spoken to this or like the consistent challenges that we face in creating and sustaining partnerships uh, synchronously and asynchronously. Um, you know, I found that when on the Fulbright, yes, face to face was the best way, um, and since I've returned, it's been more mostly synchronous and asynchronous. And I have found some challenges there, um, but the, the, the foundation was built face-to-face -face through the Fulbright. I'm also curious to know uh, what kind of challenges exist in taking the steps from a bilateral relationship um, towards more multilateral partnerships. And um, when, we try, when, we, when we return, for example, and we wish to share and create more uh, true partnerships, uh, there's multiple challenges that are faced because we're not necessarily doing face-to-face -face with our partners in the countries of, that we were, uh, we were hosted. So just a couple of questions um, in general. Um, so my Fulbright journey, I was a high school English teacher and a speech and debate coach um, in Los Angeles. And I applied to be a, a, into the program for a Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching. My, my project was about debate and language acquisition, uh, both L1 and uh, second language, which would be English. And what I was finding in my classroom regarding the emergent bilingual children I was working with is that to, uh, exponentially their language ability was increasing um, and the, their proficiency in the, in the language, the target language of English was it's exponential. And what I was seeing, I was like, I got to take this abroad to see if I'm seeing the same things. And how can I exchange ideas and, and build partnerships there? Um, the organization that I worked with primarily when I was in the Netherlands is called Debat Uni, which means debate union. And uh, we continue our partnership to this day. Um, so what was happening in the US is that you know, language teachers and content teachers uh, struggle to teach emergent bilingual children. Um, what happens is the children that are being assessed on state exams uh, aren't doing very well. And then teachers feel pressure to uh, raise test scores. And it becomes, uh, we begin sometimes to look at children as the problem and the children are not the problem. Um, but it leads to this burnout cycle uh, especially in some states where the pressure is to raise test scores. Um, <clears throat> most important, of course, are our students, right? The most important people in the room are always the students. Um, and 
it's, it's, it's unfortunate to see children feel defeated because they don't do very well on exams. Speaking and listening are not frequently taught in the classroom as standards, even though those standards do exist. Um, and we find that international psychologists and linguists, uh, such as Stephen Krashen, Long and Ellis, have long talked about the importance of input and output in language acquisition, whether it be your first language or your second or third language. And you know, reading and writing, you know, reading is an input, writing is an output, but speaking and listening, uh, listening and speaking tend to happen first. Um, and so if we're not doing that in our classrooms on a regular basis, how can we expect students who are either monolingual or emergent bilingual or multilingual to acquire language? Um, and just overall, you know, there's a lack of logical discourse um, in, in society, at least here in the United States. Um, and then we have to wonder whether or not we're teaching children by the time they leave high school to have that logical discourse and how that impacts their social emotional learning. Um, so before I left for the Fulbright, I did a little uh, study at a Los Angeles uh, Metropolitan Debate League where my students competed at a summer debate institute. And on the left, you have the, their responses when they were in middle school, and on the right is high school. And this was regarding the Common Core State Standards for Speaking and Listening. And my question, multiple questions with them, with, had really came down to how, you know, are you receiving speaking and listening standards? Um, how frequent are you doing speaking and listening in your classrooms? And that could be PE, math, English, any subject matter. And just looking at the right, we find that 60 percentile of the children, the highest was basically just occasionally. Frequently just doesn't come in very strong. And if we admit that speaking and listening is important to acquiring language, I would like to see the gray bar up in the 60 percentile and of course more. Um, so this was kind of concerning and just kind of adds to my research problem before I left for the Netherlands um, to see what they, what they were doing and um, if the students and the teachers felt the same, so. Um, so research problem, you know, co-curricular and extra, extracurricular being a debate program after school on the weekends and co-curricular being in during school. Um, academics in secondary schools can lead to um, academic achievements. And this is just in, in general, uh, co-curricular and extracurricular academics. Um, but then of course, after school as well. Um, and that leads to student achievement and student achievement in acquiring language and test scores. Uh, so in what ways does student participation in secondary school debate programs increase language acquisition? And that is both L1 and L2. Um, so I wanted to learn uh, the Dutch system of debate and the debate community, build a partnership. I wanted to learn best practices and strategies for teaching debate uh, when I returned, but also sharing uh, what I knew in this partnership. Um, I wanted to learn classroom teaching strategies from Dutch English teachers. Uh, to share teaching strategies with teachers um, and team, get an opportunity to team teach um, and to, of course to share curriculum with debate organizations about how we are how we're moving forward with curriculum and ultimately to create a professional, professional development for teachers when I returned to Los Angeles. Um, so creating the partnership was about exchanging ideas and it, it really came down to how to create a professional learning community uh, from scratch. So hi, my name's Al and I'm in your, I'm in your country for the next few months. And so uh, creating that professional learning community with an organization and with the teachers that were in that debate organization. And then how do I can sustain that when I return uh, was a big part of my project. Uh, and it was with the organization Debakuni that works specifically with secondary school children in the Netherlands. And then how to continue this PLC bilaterally. Um, and of course, within that, sharing the best practices with classroom teachers and debate organizations in a multilateral way. Now, the needs assessment is discussion debate a possible pedagogical method for teaching content and language and what is happening in the Netherlands regarding extracurricular debate and does it lead to higher levels of learning? Uh, if the Netherlands debate community is demonstrating positive results, why not teach in class and across the curriculum? Um, 
so I did a lot of uh, interviews with adults, meaning classroom teachers and debate coaches, and of course with students. Um, I ran two online surveys, um, and it ended up being about 57 adults. <clears throat> and that was a mix between those who were like debate coaches and those who were classroom teachers. And it ended up with about 65 uh, students. And then multiple classroom visits and observations, uh, going to debate tournaments. Uh, so what, what I found were regarding the first language, uh, Dutch acquisition, when it came to critical thinking, uh, both the teachers, the adults, debate coaches, teachers, and the students tend to agree that there was uh, in the 90 percentile regarding critical thinking in their first language, that debate was overwhelmingly uh, important to them and had impact on their critical thinking. Um, when it came to uh, instruction, um, did they better understand the instruction in their first language uh, when they went to class um, because of their debate experience? Um, the teachers felt like the debaters that were in class were by far the most engaged and the most articulate, um, in, again, in the 90 percentile. Um, when it came to language structure in the Dutch language, uh, what were the thoughts of teachers and students? Again, in the 90 percentile regarding it, the impact of debate on understanding the structure of language. Um, and then does debate increase their listening skills? Teachers and adults said by in the 97 percentile, absolutely. And uh, students, uh, again, in the 90 percentile. What I found regarding L1 and L2, <clears throat> uh, SLA is uh, second language acquisition. In vocabulary, uh, Again, 90 percentile, 100 percent of the students came back, said, absolutely, debate is helping my English language vocabulary increase. Um, second language acquisition writing, uh, we actually see some lower numbers, but again, 70 and 80 percentile. First language reasoning. And do you, are, are you increasing your ability to reason in the Dutch language? And again, we have very high uh, percentages of the impact of debate on their first language reasoning and their first, their first language vocabulary. Uh, regarding second language writing, uh, what I found in the Netherlands is unlike in the United States where students, when they go to debate tournaments, they have their case written. And they were in between tournaments, what they're doing is they're developing their cases, they're developing their rebuttals written, and then they can riff while they're in the debate. Um, they, they already know what the resolution is, they already know what the topics are going to be, and so they can build their cases. So their writing does increase in their first and possibly second language. Whereas in the Netherlands, it was more impromptu. The students would show up to a debate tournament and they did not know what the topics were going to be. And so they would go to some type of multi-purpose room or a cafe, whatever was at the uh, school we were competing at, or um, some type of uh, yeah, like a multi-purpose room, or sometimes an auditorium. And there, the resolution was put up on, on the screen. And so the students right away were, they were jotting down like bullet point ideas as they were brainstorming arguments, but they weren't writing full cases. And I think that's why there tend to be a, a lower response uh, regarding writing uh, in English because they weren't developing cases in between tournaments. But still a decently high percentage of saying that debate impacts their second language writing. So future scope and recommendations, and we, <clears throat> by the time we were getting ready to leave, we, we all met at the Ministry of Education and uh, a lot of the uh, top, uh, call them bureaucrats or policy makers and implementers were at that, at that meeting. So when we were presenting, I also wanted to offer not, not just what my findings were, but what are some recommendations. And so, of course, money, right? there should be at least a slight increase in funding to debate organizations and that there can be more variety. So even having elementary school children having an opportunity to do, to do speaking events uh, after school and on the weekends would be beneficial um, regarding their Dutch language acquisition, but also their second language acquisition. Um, we need to work to bridge the gap between debate organizations and teacher professional development money. So, Teachers are given opportunities for professional development, but there's, there's just a large gap in offering that um, 
with debate organizations to come in and say, you know, that some teachers are hesitant to have debate in there because they just don't know how to teach it within their content of math, history, science. Uh, in the, but you know, there has to be more of a bridging of that gap between those who can offer that professional development to teachers and uh, the time and money that teachers are offered uh, to, to seek professional development. Um, teacher professional development conference, and there should be more where teachers are brought, you know, there's that, that uh, the partnerships between school districts and universities and debate organizations. And sometimes we you know, professors of uh, teachers who teach teachers or tenants sometimes are out of the cycle of, of working in classrooms. And there's, there's, there can be a divide there. Um, and I think that not only in the Netherlands, but in the United States. I'm sorry, Al, if you could please uh, kind of summarize. Thank okay. you. Yeah, so and then coming back to teacher education programs and universities and just knowing that ultimately the, the answer is yes, discussion and debate is a method of instruction. And what is happening in the Netherlands is there is an increase in, in levels of learning. And I found that uh, it can be done in the classroom and that we need to have more civic reasoning and discourse in our, in our classrooms, regardless of where you live. And we tend to see uh, many of the same kerfuffles, regardless of where you live in this world, as, a, as an educator, um, regardless of where you go. Anyway, my contact information is here. Uh, my website is outspokenela.com. And I would love to answer any, any questions. But coming back to those overarching questions of some of the challenges that I have faced when I return is continuous, continuing a partnership bilaterally, and then how to, how to take that, that relationship and make it multilateral. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Al. Thanks. We appreciate that. Um, Emily, Emily Tan. Good morning, everyone. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to all the other presenters. Um, I've so enjoyed listening to you. The presentations this morning. Um, I'm just going to pull up my screen. Okay. Can everyone see this okay? Looks great. Okay, awesome. Um, wonderful. So I'll get started. Uh, my name is Emily Tan. I was a postgraduate Fulbright Research Scholar from 2019 to 2020. So right after I graduated um, with my bachelor's from Bates College, I moved to Australia and I partnered with um, Western Sydney University, the Marx Institute for Brain Behavior and Development um, and their baby lab. So I'll begin today by talking a little bit about the lab-based uh, empirical study that I carried out. And then I'll kind of transition into um, the community work that I got into when I was there. Okay. So um, I was really interested in learning about how different modes of infant directed communication promote the early building blocks of language development. Um, and my primary outcome that I was focusing on was word segmentation. Um, word segmentation is the ability to kind of discern where a word boundary begins and ends. And it's um, pretty well known that by about seven and a half, seven months of age, infants are reliably able to segment words from a stream of fluent speech. Um, and furthermore, this is facilitated by infant-directed speech. Um, and infant-directed speech is that kind of sing-song way that parents alter their voices to speak to their babies. Um, so babies actually have an easier time segmenting words and determining these word boundaries when their parents speak to them in this baby talk. Um, so I was curious about if infant directed song, so kind of taking that, that idea over to lullabies, play songs, that kind of communication would further facilitate word segmentation abilities in infants. Um, since you know lullabies also possess a lot of those characteristics that make infant directed communication so compelling. So like a higher pitch, greater pitch range, conveying these effective and loving messages. Um, so I designed this experiment where um, we 
basically composed a series of spoken and musical phrases, and I embedded a target word within each one. And then I used this paradigm called the head turn preference procedure, which you can see over here, to first familiarize the infants to the audio stimuli. So they heard the different phrases um, in both conditions, either the speech or the song condition. And then I tested their ability to recognize the target word that was embedded um, in isolation. So basically I did this by presenting them with both a novel word that they had not yet been familiarized to. And I also presented them with the target word that they had been um, familiarized to. So you measure then their looking times between um, the source of the different words. So if the infant is hearing the familiar word from this speaker on this side, I would measure how long that their eyes are looking in that direction. So I was kind of perched behind the curtain there in a very um, kind of traditional developmental experiment. And I'm happy to talk more about the, the methodology um, in the Q&A or feel free to send me an email afterwards. But in a nutshell, we found that infants can segment words from both speech and song conditions um, and about equivalent ability. So um, song didn't seem to further um, facilitate word segmentation, but we also found some really interesting kind of gender differences. So male infants um, excelled more at segmenting words from speech and female infants excelled at segmenting words from song. A um, couple of graphs here demonstrating that. You can see here that the, um, the infants looked longer to the familiarity, sorry, the familiarized uh, words than the novel words in both conditions. And then here you can see that um, there are some gender differences. So a couple of possible explanations that we explored, um, you know, possible gender differences in the infant responsivity um, or possible differences due to some gender stereotypes. So potentially parents speaking differently to their male and female inf um, infants uh, because of their gender. So that's another um, possibility. And we also collected some um, parent measures. So we were looking at as well the, oops, I measured the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. So this was um, administered to assess if mothers were endorsing depressive symptoms. Um, and we collected some qualitative data on the perceived frequency that parents sing to their babies. Um, and what we found, which was really interesting, is that parents who scored greater than 12 on the Edinburgh Postnatal Depressive Scale, um, which is actually clinically significant in most cases, also reported singing less frequently to their infants at home. Um, this is pretty consistent with the literature showing that mothers with postpartum depression not only communicate less frequently with their infants at home, but they also don't use infant-directed speech and infant-directed song as often, which is um, pretty important because we know that infant directed song has um, a lot of implications for, you know, these building blocks of language development. So taking into consideration these kind of clinical, um, you know, measures, we were thinking about the different ways that we could support infant language development. Um, and the other kind of theme that came up from this qualitative measure was that a lot of parents were talking about these baby rhyme time sessions at libraries. Um, a lot of parents said that the time that they most often sing to their infant was at these, these rhyme time sessions. And I had never heard of these. Um, and so I learned that these are these kind of library based parent child song time sessions with the intent of supporting literacy and parent child bonding. Um, and I was working with a lot of moms coming into my lab to um, you know, participate in my lab study. And one of them actually connected me to a facilitator at the Panania Library um, Baby Rhyme Time session. So I um, started attending the sessions. The facilitator you know, kindly invited me to the sessions and I started attending and kind of just getting a sense of what they looked at look, and like what they looked like in, in practice. Um, and they also requested that I kind of survey some of the attendees to gather some parent feedback on the sessions um, coming from kind of the research side of things. So I was so kind of grateful to Fulbright for allowing me to adapt to my project as I was there. And I think it was a great opportunity for me to be sort of introduced to some like community-based participatory, you know, very elementary, but still uh, community-based research principles. So 
Um, here's an example of one of the library rhyme time setups. And I, I attended them in probably about six different um, suburbs around Sydney. Um, I focused on four. This is the Canterbury Banks Town Library setup. And I, overall, I found that their programming was really, really robust in kind of a, a few different areas. So in terms of supporting literacy and language development, um, the sessions were age appropriate. They had like uh, six to 12 month ones, and then they had older ones. They had toddler, preschool age, um, which I found to be great. Uh, they incorporated sign language, which I think is really important in these kinds of programming settings. Um, and additionally, they promoted parent engagement. So there was a lot of joint attention going on in these sessions um, and joint attention, which is sort of this parent infant focusing on things together rather than parent teaching the infant is actually a positive predictor of language development. So um, these kind of bi-directional parent-child um, interactions and songs that were facilitated in these library sessions were, were really great. And then finally, and most notably, I would say there was this much needed social support element um, that was provided to parents. So we know that about 50 to 75 percent of mothers have baby blues after, you know, they have a child and 15 percent of them go on to to develop clinical depression. Um, and so working with so many mothers who were coming in to participate and, you know, going to these these library sessions, I got a sense of, you know, how great the loneliness and isolation can be um, as a parent, especially single parents who I was who I was meeting and working with. And the session really served as a means to connect with other parents on a weekly basis. Um, and they're accessible, they're in public spaces, and they were free of charge. So in this way, I found that the library programming was really providing direct benefit to families. So in terms of surveying the parents, I had these kind of brief and informal interviews with some of the parents across those four libraries that I was attending um, the sessions for. And I asked parents about their hopes for attending the session. What were they hoping to get out of it? I asked them what they did get out of it. And finally, I asked, you know, if they had any suggestions. So the asterisks here kind of indicate the feedback that was emphasized in the report that I provided back to the libraries at the end of my Fulbright. Um, you know, the, the main hopes were for supporting child's language development. And interestingly enough, I think the, the main kind of benefit that parents got from it was not for their child, but for themselves, just having a, an opportunity to connect with other parents. Um, and then for suggestions, I thought this was a really actionable item. They suggested some more multicultural, bilingual programming. So some, you know, different songs in different languages, which I know some of the libraries did, but not all of them. So I um, kind of assisted in thinking about different ways we could incorporate some more multicultural songs, um, songs in different languages, things like that. In terms of recommendations, I provided some kind of very basic overview recommendations based on the feedback. Um, and I, I grouped these into two kind of areas. So we had the parent mental health, and then we had the um, infant literacy and language development. So in terms of parent mental health, I suggested kind of a resource sheet, which we actually worked together to create. And we, we translated these into several different languages. So um, a couple of really reputable Australian organizations, Beyond Blue and Caratane, which provide kind of resources and support and um, you know that kind of resource and reference for parents. Um, you know, about parenting and also depression and mental health, which are really important and just kind of having those available at the sessions, not necessarily distributing them, but having them there on hand in case parents want to take them. Um, so we sort of, you know, talked about developing that kind of sheet and we worked together to develop that. We also encouraged- um, I'm, I'm sorry, oh, Emily, can you yes. uh, kind of wrap it up, please? Yes, I'm sorry, we're running over, aren't we? Okay, um, yes, so- encouraged a couple of other suggestions here. And then in terms of infant language development, kind of clarifying some misconceptions about infant directed speech, baby talk is a good thing, it's not harmful, um, prioritizing singing over recordings, that kind of thing. 
Um, in terms of next steps, I think the integration of cultural humility and trauma-informed care, which I'm really not an expert in, but I hope to study in the future, um, into these programming um, parent sessions would really help to, to strengthen them, um, given that it is a largely clinical sample. Um, and yeah, I just want to, I'll conclude by just thanking everyone and thanking Fulbright for providing me this opportunity, you know, so early on in my career. Um, I, I went on to study clinical depression at Mass General, where I currently am. I'm in a depression lab, you know, developing some clinical research skills, and I'm in the process of applying to doctoral degree in clinical psychology. So I'm hoping to continue this line of work um, and continue, you know, learning about community-based participatory methods to support parents um, and families. So yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. If I could ask all of the presenters to come back onto the screen. And unfortunately, we are very short on time. And so I think I noticed that some folks have responded to questions that were already in the chat and in the Q&A. So thank you very much for doing that. Since we are so short on time, why don't everyone just please put your contact information, your email addresses, and whatever you like in the chat. So that folks can uh, get in touch with you. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate your engagement, and we're just sorry that um, we have we've run out of time. But some great questions were raised. You've answered them, and please go ahead and put your contact information in the chat. And thank you so much again. We have another great session coming up in a few minutes. So thank you and goodbye.